Moonraker by Ian Fleming It was the beginning of a typical routine day for Bond. It was only two or three times a year that an assignment came along requiring his particular abilities. For the rest of the year, he had the duties of an easy-going senior civil servant, elastic office hours from around ten to six, lunch generally in the canteen, evenings spent playing cards in the company of a few close friends, or at Crockford's, or making love, with rather cold passion to one of three similarly disposed married women, weekends playing golf for high stakes at one of the clubs near London. There were three telephones on Bond's desk, a black one for outside calls, a green office telephone, and a red one which went only to M and his chief of staff. It was the familiar burr of the red one that broke the silence of the room. It was M's chief of staff. "'Can you come up?' asked the pleasant voice. "'Is it M?' asked Bond. "'Yes. Any clue?' "'Simply said if you were about, he'd like to see you.' "'Right,' said Bond, and put down the receiver. He collected his coat, told his secretary he would be with M and not to wait for him, left his office and walked along the corridor to the lift. While he waited for it, he thought of those other times when in the middle of an empty day the red telephone had suddenly broken the silence and taken him out of one world and set him down in another. He shrugged his shoulders. Monday. He might have expected trouble. When Bond came through the door, M was sitting at his broad desk lighting a pipe. He made a vague gesture with the lighted match towards the chair on the other side of the desk, and Bond walked over and sat down. M glanced at him sharply through the smoke, and then threw the box of matches onto the empty expanse of red leather in front of him. "'Have a good leave?' he asked abruptly. "'Yes, thank you, sir,' said Bond. "'Still sunburned, I see.' M looked his disapproval. Then he said gruffly, "'This is really nothing to do with the service. Almost a personal matter. Thought you might give me a hand.' "'Of course, sir,' said Bond. "'Thought you'd say so,' said M, gruffly. "'Won't take up much of your time. An evening ought to be enough.' He paused. "'Well, now, you've heard of this man, Sir Hugo Drax?' "'Of course, sir,' said Bond, surprised at the name. "'You can't open a paper without reading something about him. Sunday Express is running his life. Extraordinary story.' "'I know,' said M, shortly. "'Just give me the facts as you see them. I'd like to know if your version tallies with mine.' Bond gazed out of the window for a moment to marshal his thoughts. "'Well, sir,' said Bond finally, "'for one thing the man's a national hero. After all, sir,' he continued reasonably, "'it looks as if he's made this country safe from war for years. And then there's all this mystery about his real identity. I'm not surprised people feel rather sorry for him, although he is a multimillionaire. He seems to be a lonely sort of man in spite of his rich life.' M smiled dryly. All that sounds rather like a trailer for the express story. He's certainly an extraordinary man. But what's your version of the facts? I don't read the papers very carefully, and there are no files on him except at the war office, and they're not very illuminating. Now then, what's the gist of the express story? Sorry, sir, said Bond, but the facts are pretty slim. He was badly wounded in an operation during the war. Half his face was blown away. Total amnesia that lasted a year, and at the end of that time we didn't know who he was, and nor did he. There were about twenty-five other unidentified bodies that neither we nor the Americans could sort out. Either not enough bits, or perhaps people in transit, or there without authorization. It was that sort of a unit. Two commanding officers, of course, sloppy staff work, lousy records. So after a year in various hospitals, they took tracks through the war office file of missing men. And when they came to the papers of a no-next of kin called Hugo Drax, an orphan who'd been working in the Liverpool docks before the war, he showed signs of interest— and the photograph and physical description seemed to tally more or less with what our man must have looked like before he was blown up. From that time he began to mend. "'But he still doesn't really know who he is,' interrupted M. "'He's a member of Blades. I've often played cards with him and talked to him afterwards at dinner. He says he sometimes gets a strong feeling of having been there before, often goes to Liverpool to try and hunt up his past. Anyway, what else?' Bond's eyes were turned inwards, remembering. He seems to have disappeared for about three years after the war, he said. Then the city started to hear about him from all over the world. The metal market heard about him first. Seems he'd cornered a very valuable one called Columbite. And by 1950 he was a multimillionaire. And then came his astonishing letter to the Queen. Your Majesty, may I have the temerity? And in the express next day the story of how he had given to Britain his entire holding in Columbite to build a superatomic rocket, with a range that would cover nearly every capital in Europe, 
the immediate answer to anyone who tried to nuke London. He was going to put up millions out of his own pocket, and he had the design of the thing and was prepared to find the staff to build it. And then there were months of delay, and everyone got impatient, questions in the House, the opposition nearly forced a vote of confidence, and then the announcement by the Prime Minister that the design had been approved by the Woomera range experts of the Ministry of Supply, and that the Queen had been graciously pleased to accept the gift on behalf of the people of Britain, and had conferred a knighthood on the donor. Bond paused, almost carried away by the story of this extraordinary man. Yes, said M, peace in our time, this time. I remember the headline. A year ago. And now the rocket's nearly ready, the Moonraker. And from all I hear, it really should do what he says. It's very odd. He relapsed into silence, gazing out of the window. What's that, sir? asked Bond. M seemed to make up his mind. He looked mildly across at Bond. Sir Hugo Drax cheats at cards. Cheats at cards? M frowned. That's what I said, he commented dryly. It doesn't seem to you odd that a multimillionaire should cheat at cards? Bond grinned apologetically. Not as odd as all that, sir, he said. I've known very rich people cheat themselves at patience. But it just didn't fit in with my picture of Drax. Bit of an anticlimax. That's the point, said M. Why does he do it? Basildon, the chairman of Blades, came to me. Said he didn't want a fuss at the club, of course, but above all he wants to save Drax from making a fool of himself. He admires him as much as we all do, and he's terrified of an incident. You couldn't stop a scandal like that getting out. He hasn't lost since he joined a year ago. We've got two or three of the finest players in the world in the club, and none of them has ever had a record like that over twelve months. It's getting talked about in a sort of joking way, and I think Basildon's right to do something about it. What system do you suppose Drax has got? I might be able to tell if I watched, said Bond. That was what I was going to say, said M. How about coming along tonight? At any rate, you'll get a good dinner. Meet you there about six. M, with Bond beside him, wandered casually from table to table, exchanging greetings with the players, until they reached the last table beneath the fine Lawrence of Beau Brummel over the wide Adam fireplace. Double, damn you! said the loud, cheerful voice of the player with his back to Bond. Bond thoughtfully noted the head of tight reddish hair that was all he could see of the speaker, and then he looked to the left at the rather studious profile of Lord Basildon. The chairman of Blades was leaning back, looking critically down his nose at the hand of cards which he held. The other two players were of no interest to Bond. Drax didn't sort his cards into suits, as most players do, but only into reds and blacks, ungraded, making his hand very difficult to kibitz and almost impossible for one of his neighbours, if they were so inclined, to decipher. Bond knew it for the way people hold their hands, who are very careful card players indeed. Bond went and stood beside the chimney-piece. He took out a cigarette and lit it at the flame from a small gas-jet enclosed in a silver grill, a relic of the days before the use of matches, that protruded from the wall beside him. Drax gave the impression of being a little larger than life, he was physically big, about six foot tall, Bond guessed, and his shoulders were exceptionally broad. He had a big square head, and the tight reddish hair was parted in the middle. On either side of the parting, the hair dipped down in a curve towards the temples with the object, Bond assumed, of hiding as much as possible of the tissue of shining puckered skin that covered most of the right half of his face. Other relics of plastic surgery could be detected in the man's right ear, which was not a perfect match with its companion on the left, and the right eye which had been a surgical failure. It was considerably larger than the left eye because of a contraction of the borrowed skin used to rebuild the upper and lower eyelids, and it looked painfully bloodshot. Bond doubted if it was capable of closing completely, and he guessed that Drax covered it with a patch at night. To conceal as much as possible of the unsightly taut skin that covered half his face, Drax had grown a bushy reddish moustache, and had allowed his whiskers to grow down to the level of the lobes of his ears. He also had patches of hair on his cheekbones. The general effect of the face, the riot of red-brown hair, the powerful nose and jaw, the florid skin, was flamboyant. It put Bond in mind of a ringmaster at a circus. The contrasting sharpness and coldness of the left eye supported the likeness. A bullying, boorish, loud-mouthed vulgarian. That would have been Bond's verdict if he had not known something of Drax's abilities. Looking for further clues, Bond noticed that Drax was sweating rather freely. 
Despite the occasional growl of thunder outside, it was a cool evening, and yet Drax was constantly mopping his face and neck with a huge bandana handkerchief. He smoked incessantly, stubbing out the cork-tipped Virginia cigarettes after a dozen lungfuls of smoke, and almost immediately lighting another from a box of fifty in his coat pocket. His big hands, their backs thickly covered with reddish hair, were always on the move, fiddling with his cards, handling the cigarette lighter that stood beside a plain, flat, silver cigarette case in front of him, twisting a lock of hair on the side of his head, using the handkerchief on his face and neck. Occasionally he put a finger greedily to his mouth and worried a nail. Even at a distance Bond could see that every fingernail was bitten down to the quick. Bond lit another cigarette and concentrated on the game, leaving his subconscious to digest the details of Drax's appearance and manner that had seemed to him significant and that might help to explain the riddle of his cheating, the nature of which had still to be discovered. Half an hour later the cards had completed the circle. After that time Bond and M walked down the stairs and along to the secretary's office in silence. The room was in darkness. M switched on the light and went and sat down in the swivel chair in front of the busy-looking desk. He turned the chair to face Bond, who had walked over to the empty fireplace and was taking out a cigarette. "'Any luck?' he asked, looking up at him. "'Yes,' said Bond. "'He cheats all right.' "'Ah,' said M, unemotionally. "'How does he do it?' "'Only on the deal,' said Bond. "'You know that silver cigarette case he has in front of him with his lighter? He never takes cigarettes from it doesn't want to get finger marks on the surface. It's plain silver and very highly polished, and when he deals it's almost concealed by the cards and his big hands, and he doesn't move his hands away from it, deals four piles quite close to him. Every card is reflected in the top of the case. It's just as good as a mirror, although it looks perfectly innocent lying there. And he's such a good businessman it would be normal for him to have a first-class memory. The rest of the time he just plays his average game, but knowing all the cards on every fourth deal is a terrific edge. It's not surprising he always shows a profit. But one doesn't notice him doing it, protested M. It's quite natural to look down when one's dealing, said Bond. Everybody does. And he covers up with a lot of banter, much more than he produces when someone else is dealing. I expect he's got very good peripheral vision, the thing they mark us so highly for when we take our medical for the service. Very wide angle of sight. The door opened and Basildon came in. M gestured to Bond, who repeated what he had told M. Lord Basildon's face got angrier as Bond talked. "'Damn the man!' he exploded when Bond had finished. "'What the hell does he want to do that for? Bloody millionaire, rolling in money. Fine scandal we're in for. I'll simply have to tell the committee.' He paused and shot a hopeful glance at M and then at Bond. "'Is there any alternative?' "'He could be stopped,' Bond said quietly. "'That is,' he added with a thin smile, "'if you don't mind paying him out in his own coin.' Bond had once been put through a course in card-sharping for a case in Monte Carlo. Later that evening he got his chance to make a four with M, with Drax and his partner, and thereby revive his skills. By the end of the evening Bond had succeeded in taking fifteen thousand pounds from the millionaire national hero. Drax's face was dead white, but his eyes blazed redly at Bond. Suddenly he raised one clenched fist and crashed it on the table among the pile of impotent aces and kings and queens in front of him. Very low, he spat the words at Bond. You're a ch— That's enough, Drax! Basildon's voice came across the table like a whiplash. None of that talk here! I've been watching the whole game. Settle up. If you've got any complaints, put them in writing to the committee. Drax got slowly to his feet. He stood away from his chair and ran a hand through his wet red hair. The colour came slowly back into his face, and with it an expression of cunning. He glanced down at Bond, and there was in his good eye a contemptuous triumph which Bond found curiously disturbing. He leant forward and picked up his cigarette case and lighter. Then he looked again at Bond and spoke very quietly. "'I should spend the money quickly, Commander Bond,' he said. Then he turned away from the table and walked swiftly out of the room. Although he had not got to bed until two, Bond walked into his headquarters punctually at ten the next morning. He was feeling dreadful. M looked sharply at him. "'You look pretty dreadful, 007,' he said. "'Sit down.' "'It's business,' thought Bond, his pulse quickening. "'Trouble down at Drax's place last night,' he said. "'Double killing. Please try to get hold of Drax. Didn't think of blades, apparently.' 
Caught up with him when he got back to the Ritz about half past one this morning. Two men from the Moonraker got shot in a public house near the plant. Both dead. Drax told the police he couldn't care less and then hung up. Typical of the man. He's down there now, taking the thing a bit more seriously, I gather. Curious coincidence, said Bond thoughtfully. But where do we come in, sir? Isn't it a police job? Partly, said M. But it happens that we're responsible for a lot of the key personnel down there. Germans, he added. I'd better explain. He looked down at his pad. It's an RAF establishment, and the cover plan is that it's part of the big radar network along the east coast. The RAF are responsible for guarding the perimeter, and the Ministry of Supply only has authority at the centre where the work is going on. It's on the edge of the cliffs between Dover and Deal. The whole area covers about a thousand acres, but the site itself is about two hundred. On the site there are only Drax and fifty-two others left. All the construction team have gone. A pack of cards and a joker, reflected Bond. Fifty of these are Germans, continued M. More or less all the guided missile experts the Russians didn't get. Drax paid for them to come over here and work on the Moonraker. Nobody was very happy with the arrangement, but there was no alternative. The Ministry of Supply couldn't spare any of their experts from Woomera. Drax had to find his men where he could. To strengthen the RAF security people, the Ministry of Supply appointed their own security officer to live on the site, a man called Major Talon. M. paused and looked up at the ceiling. He was one of the two who got killed last night, shot by one of the Germans who then shot himself. M. lowered his eyes and looked at Bond. Bond said nothing, waiting for the rest of the story. It happened in a public house near the site. Plenty of witnesses. Apparently it's an inn on the edge of the site that is inbounds to the men. Must have somewhere to go, I suppose. M. paused. He kept his eyes on Bond. Now you ask where we come in on all this. We come in because we cleared this particular German and all the others before they were allowed to come over here. We've got the dossiers on all of them. So when this happened, the first thing RAF security in Scotland Yard wanted was the dossier of the dead man. They got on to the duty officer last night, and he dug the papers out of records and sent them over to the Yard. Routine job. He noted it in the log. When I got here this morning and saw the entry in the log, I suddenly got interested. M spoke quietly. After spending the evening with Drax, it was, as you remarked, a curious coincidence. Very curious, sir, said Bond, still waiting. And there's one more thing, concluded M. And this is the real reason why I've let myself get involved instead of keeping clear of the whole business. This has got to take priority over everything. M's voice was very quiet. They're going to fire the Moonraker on Friday. Less than four days' time. Practice shoot. M paused and reached for his pipe and busied himself lighting it. Bond said nothing. He still couldn't see what all this had to do with the Secret Service, whose jurisdiction runs only outside the United Kingdom. It seemed a job for the special branch of Scotland Yard, or conceivably for MI5. He waited, looked at his watch. It was noon. M got his pipe going and continued. The place is on the coast, about three miles north of Dover, he said. There's this inn nearby on the main coast road, the World Without Want, and the men from the site go there in the evening. Last night, about seven-thirty, the security man from the ministry, this man Talon, went along there and was having a whisky and soda and chatting away with some of the Germans, when the murderer, if you like to call him that, came in and walked straight up to Talon. He pulled out a Luger, no serial numbers, by the way, out of his shirt and said, M looked up, I love Gala Brand, you shall not have her. Then he shot Talon through the heart and put the smoking gun in his own mouth and pulled the trigger. What a ghastly business, said Bond. He could see every detail of the shambles in the crowded tap room of a typical English public house. Who's the girl? That's another complication, said M. She's an agent of the special branch, bilingual in German, one of Valence's best girls. She and Talon were the only two non-Germans Drax had with him on the site. Valence is a suspicious chap, has to be. This Moonraker plan is obviously the most important thing happening in England. Without telling anyone and acting more or less on instinct, he planted this brand girl on Drax and somehow fixed for her to be taken on as his private secretary. Been on the site since the beginning. She's had absolutely nothing to report. Says that Drax is an excellent chief, except for his manners, and drives his men like hell. Apparently he started by making passes at her, even after she'd shown she could defend herself, which of course she can. He gave up, and she says they're perfectly good friends. Naturally, she knew Talon, but he was old enough to be her father, besides being happily married with four children, and she told Valence's man who got a word with her this morning that he's taken her to the cinema in a paternal sort of way twice in eighteen months. 
As for the killer, a man called Egon Bartsch, he was an electronics expert whom she barely knew by sight. Very funny, said Bond. But why don't they close down the site and have a wholesale inquiry? After all, this thing's too big to take a chance on. The Cabinet met early this morning, said M, and the Prime Minister asked the obvious question. What evidence was there of any attempt or even of any intention to sabotage the Moonraker? The answer was none. The Minister asked me to go and see him after the Cabinet. He said that the least he could do was replace Talon at once. The new man must be bilingual in German, a sabotage expert, and have had plenty of experience of our Russian friends. MI5 have put up three candidates. They're all on cases at the moment, but they could be extricated in a few hours. But then the Minister asked my opinion. I gave it. He talked to the Prime Minister, and a lot of red tape got cut very quickly. Bond looked sharply, resentfully into the grey, uncompromising eyes. So, said M flatly, Sir Hugo Drax has been notified of your appointment, and he expects you down at his headquarters in time for dinner this evening. On his way to Dover, Bond went to see Valance. Ronnie Valance was relieved to see him. He was looking to Bond to protect the Moonraker and get one of his best officers out of what might be a bad mess. Valance was a man of great tact. For the first few minutes he had spoken only of M, and he had spoken with inside knowledge and with sincerity, without even mentioning the case he had gained Bond's friendship and cooperation. When Bond had left him, after a quarter of an hour's hard talking, each man knew that he had acquired an ally. As Bond pulled up outside Drax's house, the door opened and a manservant in a white jacket came out. He smartly opened the door of the car. "'Good evening, sir. This way, please.' He spoke woodenly and with a trace of accent. Bond followed him into the house and across a comfortable hall to a door on which the butler knocked. "'In!' Bond smiled to himself at the harsh tone of the well-remembered voice and at the note of command in the single monosyllable. At the far end of the long, bright, chintzy living room, Drax was standing with his back to an empty grate, a huge figure in a plum-coloured velvet smoking jacket that clashed with the reddish hair on his face. There were three other people standing near him, two men and a woman. "'Ah, my dear fellow,' said Drax, boisterously, striding forward to meet him and shaking him cordially by the hand, "'so we meet again, and so soon. Didn't realise you were a ruddy spy for my ministry, or I'd have been more careful about playing cards against you.' "'Spent that money yet?' he asked, leading him towards the fire. "'Not yet,' smiled Bond. "'Haven't seen the colour of it.' "'Of course! Settlement on Saturday. Probably get the cheque just in time to celebrate our little firework display, what? Now let's see.' He led Bond up to the woman. "'This is my secretary, Miss Brand.' Bond looked into a pair of very level blue eyes. "'Good evening.' He gave her a friendly smile. "'My right-hand man, Dr. Walter.' The thin elderly man with a pair of angry eyes under the shock of black hair seemed not to notice Bond's outstretched hand. He sprang to attention and gave a quick nod of the head. Walter, said the thin mouth above the black whiskers, correcting Drax's pronunciation. And my, what shall I say, my dog's body, what you might call my ADC, Willie Krebs. There was the touch of a slightly damp hand. Very pleased to meet you said an ingratiating voice, and Bond looked into a pale, round, unhealthy face, now split in a stage smile which died almost as Bond noticed it. Bond looked into his eyes. They were like two restless black buttons, and they twisted away from Bond's gaze. Both men wore spotless white overalls with plastic zip fasteners at the sleeves and ankles and down the back. Their hair was close-cropped so that the skin shone through, and they would have looked like people from another planet but for the untidy black moustache and imperial of Dr. Walter, and the pale, wispy moustache of Krebs. They were both caricatures, a mad scientist and a youthful version of Peter Lorry. The dinner was excellent. Drax was a genial host, and at his own table his manners were faultless. Most of his conversation consisted in drawing out Dr. Walter for the benefit of Bond, and it covered a wide range of technical matters which Drax took pains to explain briefly after each topic had been exhausted. Bond was impressed by the confidence with which Drax handled each abstruse problem that was raised, and by his immense grasp of detail. A genuine admiration for the man gradually developed in him, and overshadowed much of his previous dislike. He felt more than ever inclined to forget the Blades affair now that he was faced with the other Drax, 
the creator and inspired leader of a remarkable enterprise. Bond sat between his host and Miss Brand. She was far more attractive than her photograph had suggested, and it was difficult to see traces of the severe competence of a policewoman in the seductive girl beside him. That innocent, desirable girl, he reminded himself, is an extremely efficient policewoman. She knows how to kick and wear. She can break my arm probably more easily and quickly than I can break hers, and at least half of her belongs to the special branch of Scotland Yard. Of course, he reflected, there is always the other half. Dinner ended at nine. Now we will go over and introduce you to the Moonraker, said Drax, rising abruptly from the table. Walter will accompany us. He has much to do. Come along, my dear Bond. Without a word to Krebs or the girl, he strode out of the room. Bond and Walter followed him. They left the house and walked across the concrete towards the distant shape on the edge of the cliff. The moon had risen, and in the distance the squat dome shone palely in its light. A hundred yards from the site, Drax stopped. "'I will explain the geography,' he said. "'Walter, you go ahead. They'll be waiting for you to have another look at those fins. Don't worry about them, my dear fellow. Those people at high-duty alloys know what they're doing. Now!' He turned to Bond and gestured towards the milk-white dome. "'In there is the moonraker. What you see is the lid of a wide shaft that has been cut about forty foot down into the chalk. The two halves of the dome are opened hydraulically and folded back flush with that twenty-foot wall. If they were open now, you would see the nose of the moonraker just protruding above the level of the wall. Over there,' he pointed to a square shape that was almost out of sight in the direction of Deal, "'is the firing point, concrete blockhouse.' Alongside the blockhouse there's a hoist down the face of the cliff. Quite a lot of gear has been brought to the site by sea and then sent up on the hoist. That wine you hear is from the powerhouse over there, he gestured vaguely in the direction of Dover. The men's barracks and the house are protected by the blast wall, but when we fire there won't be anyone within a mile of the site, except the ministry experts and the BBC team who are going to be in the firing point. Hope it'll stand up to the blast. Walter says that the site and a lot of the concrete apron will be melted by the heat. That's all. Nothing else you need to know about until we get inside. Come along. Feeling like a visitor to an operating theatre, Bond followed Drax through a communicating door, out onto an iron catwalk, and into a blaze of spotlights that made him automatically put a hand up to his eyes as he grasped the guardrail in front of him. When he took his hand away, he was greeted by a scene of such splendour that for several minutes he stood speechless his eyes dazzled by the terrible beauty of the greatest weapon on earth. It was like being inside the polished barrel of a huge gun. From the floor forty feet below rose circular walls of polished metal, near the top of which he and Drax clung like two flies. Up through the centre of the shaft, which was about thirty feet wide, soared a pencil of glistening chromium, whose point, tapering to a needle-sharp antenna, seemed to graze the roof twenty feet above their heads. The shimmering projectile rested on a blunt cone of latticed steel, which rose from the floor between the tips of three severely back-swept delta fins that looked as sharp as surgeon's scalpels. But otherwise nothing marred the silken, spidery fingers of two light gantries which stood out from the walls and clasped the waist of the rocket between thick pads of foam rubber. "'What do you think of her?' Drax asked, as he looked with pleasure at Bond's rapt expression. "'One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen,' said Bond. "'It was easy to talk. "'There was hardly a sound in the great steel shaft, "'and the voices of the men clustered below under the tail of the rocket "'were no more than a murmur.' "'Drax pointed upwards. "'Warhead,' he explained. "'Experimental one now, of course. "'Come along to my office, show you the flight plan. "'Then we'll go off to bed.' "'Bond followed him across the floor. "'Drax turned a small handle flush with the steel wall, and a narrow door opened with a soft hiss. Three feet inside there was another steel door, and Bond noticed that they were both edged with rubber, an airlock. He closed the outer door before he opened the second and walked into his office and shut the inner door behind Bond. A map showed the eastern quarter of England from Portsmouth to Hull, and the adjoining waters from latitude fifty to fifty-five. From the red dot near Dover, which was the site of the Moonraker, Arcs showing the range in ten-mile intervals had been drawn up the map. At a point eighty miles from the site, between the Frisian Islands and Hull, there was a red diamond in the middle of the ocean. That was Moonraker's target. Wednesday morning, 
found Gala Brand punctually at 8.30 in her office. There was a sheaf of Air Ministry teleprints on her desk, and her first action was to transfer a digest of their contents onto a weather map and walk through the communicating door into Drax's office and pin the map to the board that hung in the angle of the wall beside the blank glass wall. Then she pressed the switch that illuminated the wall map, made some calculations based on the columns of figures revealed by the light, and entered the results on the diagram she had pinned to the board. She had done this with Air Ministry figures that became more and more precise as the practice shoot drew nearer every day since the site was completed and the building of the rocket had begun inside it, and she had become so expert that she now carried in her head the gyro settings for almost every variation in the weather at the different altitudes. So it irritated her all the more that Drax did not seem to accept her figures. Every day, when punctually at nine the warning bells clanged and he came down the steep iron stairway into his office, his first action was to call for the insufferable Dr. Walter, and together they would work out all her figures afresh and transfer the results to the thin black notebook that Drax always carried in the hip pocket of his trousers. She knew that this was an invariable routine, and she had become tired of watching it through an inconspicuous hole she had drilled, so as to be able to send Valence a weekly record of Drax's visitors. The method was amateurish, but effective, and she had slowly built up a complete picture of the daily routine she came to find so irritating. It was irritating for two reasons. It meant that Drax didn't trust her figures, and it undermined her chance of having some part, however modest, in the final launching of the rocket. Wednesday morning found Bond once again in Drax's office, this time seated next to Gala Brand and in front of Drax's desk. "'We've got other things to talk about,' said Drax. Two more days to go, so I'd better tell you the programme. He got up from his chair and paced heavily up and down the room behind his desk. "'Today is Wednesday,' he said. "'At one o'clock the site will be closed for fueling. This will be supervised by Dr. Walter and myself and two men from the Ministry. And just in case anything goes wrong, a television camera will record everything we do. Then, if there is an explosion, our successors will know better next time. He barked a short laugh. Weather permitting, the roof will be open tonight to allow the fumes to clear. My men will stand guard in watches at ten yard intervals a hundred yards from the site. There will be three armed men on the beach opposite the exhaust hole in the cliff. Tomorrow morning the site will be opened again until midday for a final check, and from that moment, except for the gyro settings, the Moonraker will be ready to go. The guards will be permanently on duty round the site. On Friday morning I shall personally supervise the gyro settings. The men from the Ministry will take over the firing point, and the RAF will man the radar. The BBC will set up their vans behind the firing point, and will begin their running commentary at 11.45. At midday, exactly, I shall press the plunger, a radio beam will break an electric circuit, and, he smiled broadly, we shall see what we shall see. Everything seems to have been taken care of, said Bond. There doesn't seem to be very much for me to do in the time that's left. Nothing that I can think of, agreed Drax. Why don't you have a look at the beach and the bottom of the cliff? That's the only weak spot I can think of. I've often thought that if someone wanted to get into the site, he would try the exhaust pit. Take Miss Brand with you, two pairs of eyes and so forth, and she won't be able to use her office until tomorrow morning. Good, said Bond. I'd certainly like to have a look at the seaward side after lunch, and if Miss Brand's got nothing better to do. He turned towards her with his eyebrows raised. Gala Brand looked down her nose. Certainly, if Sir Hugo wishes, she said without enthusiasm. Drax rubbed his hands together. "'Then that's settled,' he said. "'And now I must get down to work. Miss Brand, would you ask Dr. Walter to come along if he's free? See you at lunch,' he said to Bond, on a note of dismissal. Bond nodded. "'I think I'll walk over and have a look at the firing point,' he said, not quite knowing why he lied. He turned and followed Gala Brand out through the double doors. Outside, Bond approached the house under cover of the wide blast wall and then quickly crossed the few yards to the front door. Bond walked carefully across the hall and up the stairs, placing his feet flat on the ground and using the extreme edges of the steps where the boards would be less likely to creak. There was no noise in the corridor, but Bond saw that his door at the far end was open. He took his gun from under his armpit and walked swiftly down the carpeted passage. Krebs had his back to him. He was kneeling forward in the middle of the floor with his elbows on the ground, 
His hands were at the wheels of the combination lock of Bond's leather case. His whole attention was focused on the click of the tumblers in the lock. The target was tempting, and Bond didn't hesitate. His teeth showed in a hard smile. He took two quick paces into the room, and his foot lashed out. All his force was behind the point of his shoe, and his balance and timing were perfect. The scream of a jay was driven out of Krebs, as like the caricature of a leaping frog, he hurtled over Bond's case across a yard or so of carpet and into the front of the mahogany dressing table. His head hit the middle of it so hard that the heavy piece of furniture rocked on its base. The scream was abruptly cut off, and he crashed in an inert spread eagle on the floor and lay still. Bond stood looking at him and listening for the sound of hurrying footsteps but there was still silence in the house. He walked over the sprawling figure and bent down and heaved it over on its back. The face around the smudge of yellow moustache was pale, and some blood had oozed down over the forehead from a cut in the top of the skull. The eyes were closed and the breathing was laboured. Bond knelt down on one knee and went carefully through every pocket of Krebs' neat grey pinstripe suit, laying the disappointingly meagre contents on the carpet beside the body. There was no pocketbook and no papers. The only objects of interest were a bunch of skeleton keys, a spring knife with a well-sharpened stiletto blade, and an obscene little truss-shaped black leather cosh. Bond pocketed these, and then went to his bedside table and fetched the untouched bottle of Vichy water. It took five minutes to revive Krebs and get him into a sitting position with his back to the dressing table, and another five for him to be capable of speaking. Gradually the colour came back to his face, and the craftiness to his eyes. "'I answer no questions except to Sir Hugo,' he said as Bond started the interrogation. "'You have no right to question me. I was doing my duty.' His voice was surly and assured. Bond took the empty Vichy bottle by the neck. "'Think again,' he said, "'or I'll beat the daylight out of you until this breaks and then use the neck for some plastic surgery. Who told you to go over my room?' Krebs spat an obscene insult at him in German. Bond bent down and cracked him sharply across the shins. Krebs's body cringed, but as Bond raised his arm again, he suddenly shot up from the floor and dived under the descending bottle. The blow caught him hard on the shoulder, but it didn't check his momentum, and he was out of the door and halfway down the corridor before Bond started in pursuit. Bond stopped outside the door and watched the flying figure swerve down the stairs and out of sight. Then as he heard the scurrying squeak of the rubber-soled shoes as they fled down the stairs and across the hall, he laughed abruptly to himself and went back into his room and locked the door. Short of beating the man's brains out, it hadn't looked as if he would get much out of Krebs. He'd given him something to think about. Crafty little brute. His injuries couldn't have been so bad after all. Well, it would be up to Drax to punish him. Unless, of course, Krebs had been carrying out Drax's orders. It was a wonderful afternoon of blue and green and gold. When Bond and Galabrand left the concrete apron through the guard gate near the empty firing point, now connected by a thick cable with the launching site, they stopped for a moment on the edge of the great chalk cliff, and stood gazing over the whole corner of England, where Caesar had first landed two thousand years before. The peace was broken by two blasts on the siren from the house, and they turned to gaze back at the ugly concrete world that had been cleaned out of their minds. As they watched, a red flag was broken out above the dome of the launching site, and two RAF crash wagons with red crosses on their sides rolled out of the trees to the edge of the blast wall and pulled up. Fueling's going to begin, said Bond. Let's get on with our walk. There'll be nothing to see, and if there happened to be something, we probably wouldn't survive it at this range. She smiled at him. Yes, she said. I'm sick of the sight of all this concrete. They walked on down the gentle slope and were soon out of sight of the firing point and the high wire fence. The ice of Gala's reserve melted quickly in the sunshine. Bond told her of his discovery of Krebs and of the scene in his bedroom. Serves him right, she said. I've never trusted him. But what did Sir Hugo say? I had a word with him before lunch, said Bond. Gave him Krebs's knife and keys as proof. He was furious and went straight off to see the man, muttering with rage. When he came back, he said that Krebs seemed to be in a pretty bad way, and was I satisfied that he'd been punished enough? All that business about not wanting to upset the team at the last moment, and so forth. So I agreed that he'd be sent back to Germany next week, and that meanwhile he would consider himself under open arrest, only allowed out of his room under surveillance. 
They scrambled down a steep cliff path to the beach, and turned to the right beside the deserted small-arms range of the Royal Marine garrison at Deal. They walked along in silence until they came to the two-mile stretch of shingle that runs at low tide beneath the towering white cliffs to St. Margaret Bay. Bond stood looking out to sea. Gala noticed him frown. If they had covering fire from a submarine or an X-craft, a good team could still do it, he said. It'll be hell, but I'm going for a swim. The Admiralty chart says there's a twelve-fathom channel out there, but I'd like to have a look. There must be plenty of water at the end of the jetty, but I'll be happier when I've seen it for myself. He smiled at her. Well, why don't you have a bathe, too? It's going to be damn cold, but it would do you good after stewing inside that concrete dome all the morning. Gala's eyes lit up. Do you think I could? she asked doubtfully. I'm frightfully hot. But what are we going to wear? She blushed at the thought of her brief and almost transparent nylon pants and brassier. To hell with that, said Bond airily. You must have got some bits and pieces on underneath, and I've got pants on. We shall be perfectly respectable, and there's no one to see, and I promise not to look. He lied cheerfully, leading the way round the next bend in the cliff. You undress behind that rock, and I'll use this one, he said. Come on, don't be a goose. It's all in the line of duty. Without waiting for her to answer, he moved behind the tall rock, taking off his shirt as he did so. Oh, well, said Gala, relieved to have the decision taken out of her hands. She went behind the rock and slowly unbuttoned her skirt. When she peered nervously out, Bond was already halfway down the strip of coarse brown sand that led out among the pools to where the incoming tide eddied through the green and black moraine of the rocks. He looked lithe and brown. The blue pants were reassuring. Gingerly she followed him, and then suddenly she was in the water. At once nothing else mattered but the velvet ice of the sea, and the beauty of the patches of sand between the waving hair of seaweed that she could see in the clear green depths below her as she buried her head and swam along parallel with the shore in a fast crawl. When she was level with the jetty, she stopped for a moment to get her breath. There was no sign of Bond, whom she had last seen streaking along a hundred yards ahead of her. She trod water, hard to keep up her circulation, and then started back again, unwillingly thinking of him, thinking of the hard brown body that must be somewhere near her, among the rocks, perhaps, or diving to the sand to gauge the depth of water that would be available to an enemy. She turned back to look for him again, and it was then that he suddenly surged up from the sea beneath her. She felt the quick, tight clasp of his arms round her, and the swift, hard impact of his lips on hers. "'Damn you!' she said furiously. But already he had dived again, and by the time she had spat out a mouthful of seawater and got her bearings, he was swimming blithely twenty yards away. She turned and swam aloofly out to sea, feeling rather ridiculous but determined to snub him. It was just as she had thought. These secret service people always seemed to have time for sex, however important their jobs might be. But her body obstinately tingled with the shock of the kiss, and the golden day seemed to have taken on a new beauty. As she swam further out to sea, and then turned back and looked along the snarling milk-white teeth of England, to the ravens and gulls tossed against the vivid backcloth of green fields, she decided that anything was permissible on such a day and that, just this once, she would forgive him. Half an hour later, they were lying, waiting for the sun to dry them, separated by a respectable yard of sand at the foot of the cliff. Bond was dreamily watching the gulls on the cliff face, as he listened to the girl chatter away, when suddenly both gulls dashed away from the ledge with a single shrill scream of fear. At the same moment there was a puff of black smoke and a soft boom from the top of the cliff, and a great section of the white chalk directly above Bond and Gala seemed to sway outwards, zigzag cracks snaking down its face. The next thing Bond knew was that he was lying on top of Gala, his face pressed into her cheek, and that the air was full of thunder, that his breath was stifled, and that the sun had gone out. His back was numb and aching under a great weight, and in his left ear, beside the echo of the thunder, there was the end of a choking scream. He was barely conscious, and he had to wait until his senses came halfway back to life. He made frantic efforts to move. Only in his right arm, the arm nearest to the cliff, was there any play at all. But as he jerked his shoulder, the arm became freer until at last, with a great backward heave, light and air reached down to them. Retching in the fog of chalk dust, he widened the hole until his head could take its crushing weight off Gala. He felt the feeble movement as she turned her head sideways towards the light and air. 
A growing trickle of dust and stones into the hole he had cleared made him dig fiercely again. Gradually he enlarged the space until he could get a purchase on his right elbow, and then, coughing so that he thought his lungs would burst, he heaved his right shoulder up until suddenly it and his head were free. His first thought was that there had been an explosion in the moonraker. He looked up at the cliff and then along the shore. No, they were a hundred yards from the site. It was only in the skyline directly above them that a great mouthful had been bitten out of the cliff. Then he thought of their immediate danger. Gala moaned, and he could feel the frantic thud of her heart against his chest, but the ghastly white mask of her face was now free to the air, and he wrenched his body from side to side on top of her to try and ease the pressure on her lungs and stomach. Slowly, inch by inch, his muscles cracking under the strain, he worked his way under the pile of dust and rubble towards the cliff face where he knew the weight would be less. And then at last his chest was free, and he could snake his body into a kneeling position beside her. Blood dripped from his cut back and arms, and mingled with the chalk dust that continually poured down the sides of the hole he had made. But he could feel that no bones were broken, and in the rage of the rescue work he felt no pain. Grunting and coughing, and without a pause to take breath, he heaved her up into a sitting position, and with a bleeding hand wiped some of the chalk dust from her face. Then, freeing his legs from the tomb of chalk, he somehow manhandled her up onto the top of the mound, with her back against the cliff. Down to the beginning of the rocks, now lapped by the incoming tide, sprawled the debris of the cliff face, an avalanche of chalk blocks and shapes. The white dust of its collapse covered nearly an acre. Above it a jagged rent had appeared in the cliff, and a wedge of blue sky had been bitten out of the distant top where before the line of the horizon had been almost straight. There were no longer any seabirds near them, and Bond guessed that the smell of disaster would keep them away from the place for days. The nearness of their bodies to the cliff was what had saved them, that and the slight protection of the overhang below which the sea had bitten into the base of the cliff. They had been buried by the deluge of smaller stuff. The heavier chunks, any one of which would have crushed them, had fallen outwards, the nearest missing them by a few feet. And their nearness to the cliff was the reason for Bond's right arm having been comparatively free, so that they had been able to burrow out of the mound before they were stifled. Bond realised that if some reflex had not hurled him on top of Gala at the moment of the avalanche, they would both now be dead. He felt her hand on his shoulder. Without looking at her, he put his arm round her waist, and together they got down to the blessed sea, and let their bodies fall weakly, thankfully, into the shallows. Ten minutes later, it was two comparatively human beings who walked back up the sand to the rocks where their clothes lay, a few yards away from the cliff fall. They were both completely naked. The rags of their underclothing lay somewhere under the pile of chalk dust, torn off in their struggle to escape. But like survivors from a shipwreck, their nakedness meant nothing. Washed clean of the cloying, gritty chalk dust, and with their hair and mouths scoured with the salt water, they felt weak and bedraggled. But by the time they'd got their clothes on and had shared Gala's comb, there was little to show what they'd been through. They sat with their backs to a rock, and Bond lit a first delicious cigarette, drinking the smoke deeply into his lungs and expelling it slowly through his nostrils. When Gala had done the best she could with her powder and lipstick, he lit a cigarette for her, and as he handed it to her, for the first time they looked into each other's eyes and smiled. Then they sat and looked silently out to sea, at the golden panorama that was the same and yet entirely new. Bond broke the silence. Well, by God, he said, that was close. I still don't know what happened, said Gala, except that you saved my life. She put her hand on his, then took it away. If you hadn't been there, I should be dead, said Bond. If I'd stayed where I was, he shrugged his shoulders. Then he turned and looked at her. I suppose you realize, he said flatly, that someone pushed the cliff down on us. She looked back at him with wide eyes. If we searched around it all that, he gestured towards the avalanche of chalk, we would find the marks of two or three drill holes and traces of dynamite. I saw the smoke and I heard the bang of the explosion a split second before the cliff came down. And so did the gulls, he added. And what's more, continued Bond after a pause, it can't have been only Krebs. It was done in full view of the site. 
and it was done by several people, well organized, with spies on us from the moment we went down the cliff path to the beach. There was comprehension in Gala's eyes, and a flash of fear. What are we to do? she asked anxiously. What's it all about? They want us dead, said Bond calmly. So we have to stay alive. As to what it's all about, we'll just have to find that out. At half past eight, the taxi from St. Margaret's dropped them at the second guard gate, and they showed their passes and walked quietly up through the trees onto the expanse of concrete. They both felt keyed up and in high spirits. A hot bath and an hour's rest at the accommodating Granville Hotel had been followed by two stiff brandies and sodas for Gala, and three for Bond, followed by delicious fried soles and Welsh rabbits and coffee. And now, as they confidently approached the house, it would have needed second sight to tell that they were both dead tired, and that they were naked and bruised under their walking clothes. They let themselves quietly in through the front door, and stood for a moment in the lighted hall. A cheerful mumble of voices came from the dining-room. There was a pause, followed by a burst of laughter which was dominated by the harsh bark of Sir Hugo Drax. Bond's mouth twisted wryly as he led the way across the hall to the door of the dining-room. Then he fixed a cheerful smile on his face and opened the door for Gala to pass through. Drax sat at the head of the table, festive in his plum-coloured smoking jacket. A fork full of food halfway to his open mouth had stopped in mid-air as they appeared in the doorway. Unnoticed, the food slid off the fork and fell with a soft, distinct plep onto the edge of the table. Krebs had been in the act of drinking a glass of red wine, and the glass, frozen against his mouth, poured a thin trickle down his chin and thence onto his brown satin tie and yellow shirt. Dr. Walter had his back to the door, and it was not until he observed the unusual behaviour of the others, the bulging eyes, the gape of the mouths, and the blood-drained faces, that he whipped his head round towards the door. His reactions, thought Bond, were slower than the others, or else his nerves were steadier. Ach so, he said softly, the Englander. Drax was on his feet. My dear chap, he said thickly, my dear chap, we were really very worried, just wondering whether to send out a search party. A few minutes ago, one of the guards came in and reported there seemed to have been a cliff fall. He came round towards them, his napkin in one hand and the fork still erect in the other. With the movement, the blood surged back into his face, which became first mottled, then its usual red. You really might have let me know, he spoke to the girl, anger rising in his voice. Most extraordinary behaviour. It was my fault, said Bond, moving forward into the room so that he could keep them all in view. The walk was longer than I expected. I thought we might get caught by the tide. So we went on to St. Margaret's and had something to eat there and took a taxi. Miss Brand wanted to telephone, but I thought we'd be back before eight. You must put the blame on me. But please go ahead with your dinner. Perhaps I might join you for coffee and dessert? I expect Miss Brand would prefer to go to her room. She must be tired after her long day. Bond walked deliberately round the table and took the chair next to Krebs. Bond decided to probe a little. How did the fueling go? he asked. Excellently, Drax said. Everything is ready now. The guards are out. An hour or two clearing up down there in the morning and then the site will be closed. By the way, he added, I shall be taking Miss Brand up to London in the car tomorrow afternoon. I shall need a secretary as well as Krebs. Have you got any plans? I have to go to London, too, said Bond on an impulse. I have my final report to make to the Ministry. In his room, Bond took a hot bath and used half a bottle of iodine on the cuts and bruises he could reach. Then he got into bed and turned out the light. His body hurt and he was exhausted. Tomorrow he would arrange to meet Gala in London and bring her back with him. Or she could even stay up in London for the night. Either way, he would look after her until the Moonraker was safely fired, and then, before work began on the Mark II weapon, there would have to be a very thorough clean-up indeed. But these were treacherously comforting thoughts. There was danger about, and Bond knew it. He finally drifted into sleep with one small scene firmly fixed in his mind. There had been something very disquieting about the dinner-table downstairs. It had been laid for only three people. The next day Bond headed back for London, having told Gala where to meet him. Drax in his Mercedes took the same route somewhat later, accompanied by Krebs and Gala. It was a hot, sunny day, and Drax was driving in his shirt-sleeves, 
Gala glanced down and to the left at the top of the little black book protruding from his hip pocket. This drive might be her last chance. Since the evening before she had felt a different person. Perhaps Bond had aroused her competitive spirit. Perhaps it was revulsion from playing the secretary too long. Perhaps it was the shock of the cliff-fall and the zest of realising after so many quiet months that she was playing a dangerous game. But now she felt the time had come to take risks. Discovery of the Moonraker's flight plan was a routine affair, and it would give her personal satisfaction to find out the secret of the black notebook. It would be easy. Casually she laid her folded coat over the space between herself and Drax. At the same time she made a show of arranging herself comfortably, during the course of which she drew an inch or two nearer Drax, and her hand came to rest in the folds of the coat between them. In the middle of the next harsh manoeuvre in Drax's driving, it was natural for Gala to allow herself to be thrown towards him. At the same time, her left hand dived under the coat, and her fingers touched, felt, and extracted the book in one flow of motion. Now it was a question of facing Drax's growl of rage, as with a maidenly but urgent voice she asked if she could possibly stop for a moment to powder her nose. The car swerved up to the front of the inn and stopped with a jerk. "'Hurry up, hurry up!' said Drax, as Gala, leaving the door of the car open, sped obediently across the gravel, her coat with its precious secret held tightly in front of her body. She locked the door of the lavatory and snatched open the notebook. There they were, just as she had thought. On each page, under the date, the neat columns of figures, the atmospheric pressure, the wind velocity, the temperature, just as she had recorded them from the air ministry figures, and at the foot of each page the estimated settings for the gyro compasses. Gala frowned. At a glance she could see that they were entirely different from hers. Drax's figures simply bore no relation to hers whatsoever. She turned to the last completed page containing the figures for that day. Why, she was wrong by nearly ninety degrees on the estimated course. If the rocket were fired on her flight plan, it would land somewhere in France. She looked wildly at her face in the mirror over the wash-basin. How could she have gone so monstrously wrong? And why hadn't Drax ever told her? Why, she ran quickly through the book again, every day she had been ninety degrees out, firing the moonraker at right angles to its true course and yet she simply couldn't have made such a mistake. Did the Ministry know these secret figures? And why should they be secret? Suddenly her bewilderment turned to fright. She must somehow get safely, quietly to London and tell somebody. The engine of the Mercedes was turning over. Drax glowered at her impatiently as she scrambled back into her seat. "'Come on, come on,' he said, putting the car into third and taking his foot off the clutch so that she nearly caught her ankle in the heavy door. The tyres churned up the gravel as he accelerated out of the parking place and dry skidded into the London road. Gala was jerked back, but she remembered to let the coat with her guilty hand in its folds fall on the seat between her and the driver. Then another hand struck like a snake. Got you! Krebs was leaning half over the back of the driving seat. His hand was crushing hers into the slippery cover of the notebook under the folds of the coat. Drax reached over one gloved hand and wrenched Gala's face towards him. "'What is this?' "'I can explain it, Sir Hugo,' Gala tried to bluff against the horror and desperation she knew was in her face. "'It's a mistake. I didn't mean—' With his other hand, Krebs had whipped the coat away, and there were the bent white fingers of her left hand crushed into the cover of the notebook, still a foot away from Drax's hip pocket. "'So!' The word was deadly cold and with a shivering finality. An hour later, passers-by saw a white Mercedes draw up outside a small house at the Buckingham Palace end of Ebury Street, and two kind gentlemen help a sick girl out and through the front door. Gala came to herself in a large top-floor room that seemed to be full of machinery. She was tied very securely to a chair, and apart from the searing pain in her head, she could feel that her lips and cheek were bruised and swollen. Drax, his back to her, was watching the dials on a machine that looked like a very large radio set. There were three more similar machines in her line of sight, and from one of them a thin steel aerial reached up to a rough hole that had been cut for it in the plaster of the ceiling. The room was brightly lit by several tall standard lamps, each of which held a naked high-wattage bulb. To her left, 
there was a noise of tinkering, and by swivelling her half-closed eyes in their sockets, which made the pain in her head much worse, she saw the figure of Krebs bent over an electric generator on the floor. She heard Drax speaking in German. "'You damn fool! Hurry up! I've got to go and see those bloody oafs at the Ministry!' "'At once, my captain,' said Krebs dutifully. Gala closed her eyes and decided that her only hope was to feign unconsciousness for as long as possible. Did they intend to kill her? Here, in this room? And what was all this machinery? It looked like wireless or perhaps radar? That curved glass screen above Drax's head that had given an occasional flicker as Drax fiddled with the knobs below the dials. Slowly her mind started to work again. Why, for instance, was Drax suddenly talking perfect German? And why did Krebs address him as Herr Kapitän? And the figures in the black book? Why did they nearly kill her because she'd seen them? What did they mean? Ninety degrees? Ninety degrees! Lazily her mind turned the problem over. Ninety degrees difference. Supposing her figures had been right all the time for the target eighty miles away in the North Sea, just supposing she had been right, then she wouldn't have been aiming the rocket into the middle of France after all. But Drax's figures, ninety degrees to the left of her North Sea target, somewhere in England, presumably. Eighty miles from Dover? Yes, of course. That was it. Drax's figures. The firing plan in the little black book. They would drop the moonraker just about in the middle of London. Bond sat at his favourite restaurant table in London, the right-hand corner table for two on the first floor, and watched the people and the traffic in Piccadilly and down the Haymarket. He wondered why Gala was late. It was not like her. She was the sort of girl who would telephone if she'd been kept at the yard. Valance, whom he had visited at five, had said that Gala was due with him at six. Valance had been very anxious to see her. He was a worried man, and when Bond reported briefly on the security of the Moonraker, Valance seemed to be listening with only half his mind. It appeared that all day there had been heavy selling of sterling. It had started in Tangier and quickly spread to Zurich and New York. The pound had been fluctuating wildly in the money markets of the world, and the arbitrage dealers had made a killing. The net result was that the pound was a whole three cents down on the day, and the forward rates were still weaker. It was front-page news in the evening papers, and at the close of business the Treasury had got on to Valance and told him the extraordinary news that the selling wave had been started by Drax Metals Limited in Tangier. Bond looked at his watch. Now it was eight o'clock, and suddenly he shivered. He got straight up from his table and walked out to the telephone. He called Valance. "'That you, Bond? Seen anything of Miss Brand?' Bond's heart went cold. No, he said sharply. She's half an hour late for dinner. Didn't she turn up at six? No, and I've had a tray sent out, and there's no sign of her at the usual address she stays at when she comes to London. What do you know of Drax's movements? said Bond. He wasn't expected at the Ministry until seven, said Valance. I left word— There was a confused noise on the line, and Bond heard Valance say, Thanks. He came back on the line. Just got a report passed on to me, he said. Let's see, he read. Sir Hugo Drax arrived, Ministry, 1900 hours, left 2000, left message, dining at Blades if wanted, back at site 2300. Valance commented, That means he'll be leaving London about nine. Just a moment. He read on. Sir Hugo stated Miss Brand felt unwell on arrival in London, but at her request he left her at Victoria Station bus terminal at 1645. Miss Brand stated she would rest with some friends, address unknown, and contact Sir Hugo at Ministry at 1900. She had not done so. And that's all, said Valance. Oh, by the way, we made the inquiry about Miss Brand on your behalf, said you had arranged to meet her at six, and she hadn't turned up. Yes, said Bond, his thoughts elsewhere. That doesn't seem to get us anywhere. I'll have to get busy. Just one more thing. Has Drax got a place in London, flat or anything like that? He always stays at the Ritz nowadays, said Valance. Sold his house in Grosvenor Square when he moved down to Dover. But we happen to know he's got some sort of an establishment in Ebury Street. We checked there, but there was no answer to the bell, and my man said the house looked unoccupied. Bond rang off. He picked up the receiver again and called Blades. This is the Ministry of Supply, he said. Is Sir Hugo Drax in the club? Yes, sir. It was the friendly voice of Brevet, 
He's in the dining room. Do you wish to speak to him? No, it's all right, said Bond. I just wanted to make certain he hadn't left yet. Without noticing what he was eating, Bond wolfed down some food and left the restaurant at 8.45. His car was outside waiting for him, and he said good night to the driver from headquarters and drove to St. James's Street. He parked under cover of the central row of taxis outside Boodle's and settled himself behind an evening paper over which he could keep his eyes on a section of Drax's Mercedes, which he was relieved to see standing in Park Street, unattended. He had not long to wait. Suddenly a broad shaft of yellow light shone out from the doorway of Blades, and the big figure of Drax appeared. He wore a heavy ulster up round his ears and a cap pulled down over his eyes. He walked quickly to the white Mercedes, slammed the door, and was away across the left-hand side of St. James's Street and breaking to turn opposite St. James's Palace, while Bond was still in third. God, the man moves quickly, thought Bond, doing a racing change round the island in the Mall, with Drax already passing the statue in front of the palace. He kept the Bentley in third and thundered in pursuit, Buckingham Palace Gate, so it looked like Ebury Street. Keeping the white car just in view, Bond made hurried plans. The lights at the corner of Lower Grosvenor Place were green for Drax and red for Bond. Bond jumped them and was just in time to see Drax swing left into the beginning of Ebury Street. Gambling on Drax making a stop at his house, Bond accelerated to the corner and pulled up just short of it. As he jumped out of the Bentley, leaving the engine ticking over, and took the few steps towards Ebury Street, he heard two short blasts on the Mercedes horn as he carefully edged round the corner. He was in time to see Krebs helping the muffled figure of a girl across the pavement. Then the door of the Mercedes slammed, and Drax was off again. Bond raced back to his car, whipped into third, and went after him. There were three separate sources of pain in Gala's body. The throbbing ache behind her left ear, the bite of the flex at her wrists, and the chafing of the strap round her ankles. Every bump in the road, every swerve, every sudden pressure of Drax's foot on the brakes or the accelerator awoke one or another of these pains and rasped at her nerves. She suddenly heard Krebs's voice. There was a note of urgency in it. "'My captain,' he said, "'I have been watching a car for some time. "'It is certainly following us. "'It has seldom been using its lights. "'It is only a hundred metres behind us now. "'I think it is the car of Commander Bond.' "'Drax grunted with surprise, "'and she could hear his big body shift round to get a quick look. "'He swore sharply, and then there was silence, "'and she could feel the big car weaving and straining in the thin traffic. "'James,' whispered Gala to herself, "'there's only you left. "'Be careful, but make haste.' Drax took the left-hand fork at Charing and hissed up the long hill. Ahead, in the giant beam of his headlights, one of Bowwater's huge eight-wheeled AEC diesel carriers was just grinding into the first bend of the hairpin, labouring under the fourteen tons of newsprint it was taking on a night run to one of the East Kent newspapers. Drax cursed under his breath as he saw the long carrier with the twenty gigantic rolls, each containing five miles of newsprint roped to its platform right in the middle of the tricky S-bend at the top of the hill. Suddenly he roared around it, accelerating fiercely. He laughed maniacally as he saw in his mirror Bond's car swerve into the roadside ditch. Bond was lying face downwards at the bottom of the bank, twenty feet away from the car. Krebs turned him over. His face was covered with blood, but he was breathing. They searched him thoroughly, and Drax pocketed the slim Beretta. Then together they hauled him across the road and wedged him into the back seat of the Mercedes, half on top of Gala. Gala could taste Bond's blood. His face was beside hers on the leather seat, and she shifted to give him more room. His breathing was heavy and irregular, and she wondered how badly he was hurt. Tentatively she whispered into his ear, and then louder. He groaned and his breath came faster. "'James!' she whispered urgently. "'James!' He mumbled something, and she pushed hard against him. He uttered a string of obscenities, and his body heaved. He lay still again, and she could almost feel him exploring his sensations. "'It's me, Gala. she felt him stiffen. "'Christ,' he said. "'Hell of a mess. "'Are you all right? Is there nothing broken?' She felt him tense his arms and legs. "'Seems all right,' he said. "'Crack on the head. Am I talking sense?' "'Of course,' said Gala. "'Now listen.' Hurriedly she told him all she knew, beginning with the notebook. His body was as rigid as a board against her, and he hardly breathed as he listened to the incredible story. Then they were running into Canterbury, and Bond put his mouth to her ear. 
going to try and chuck myself over the back, he whispered. Get to a telephone. Only hope. He started to heave himself up on his knees, his weight almost grinding the breath out of the girl. There was a sharp crack, and he fell back on top of her. Another move out of you, and you're dead, said the voice of Krebs, coming softly between the front seats. Only another twenty minutes to the site. Gala gritted her teeth and set about bringing Bond back to consciousness again. She had only just succeeded when the car drew up at the door of the launching dome, and Krebs, a gun in his hand, was undoing the bonds round their ankles. They had a glimpse of the familiar moonlit cement and of the semicircle of guard some distance away before they were hustled through the door and out onto the iron catwalk inside the launching dome. There the gleaming rocket stood, beautiful, innocent, like a new toy for Cyclops. But there was a horrible smell of chemicals in the air, and to Bond the Moonraker was a giant hypodermic needle, ready to be plunged into the heart of England. Despite a growl from Krebs, he paused on the stairway and looked up at its glittering nose. A million deaths. A million, a million, a million. On his hands, for God's sake, on his hands. With Krebs's gun prodding him, he went slowly down the steps on the heels of Gala. As he turned through the doors of Drax's office, he pulled himself together. Suddenly his mind was clear, and all the lethargy and pain had left his body. Something, anything, must be done. Somehow he would find a way. His whole body and mind became focused and sharp as a blade. His eyes were alive again, and defeat sloughed off him like the skin of a snake. Drax had gone ahead and was sitting at his desk. He had a luger in his hand. It was pointing at a spot halfway between Bond and Gala, and it was steady as a rock. Behind him, Bond heard the double doors thud shut. "'I was one of the best shots in the Brandenburg Division,' said Drax, conversationally. "'Tie her to that chair, Krebs, then the man.' Gala looked desperately at Bond. "'You won't shoot,' said Bond. "'You'd be afraid of touching off the fuel.' He walked slowly towards the desk. Drax smiled cheerfully and looked along the barrel at Bond's stomach. "'Your memory is bad, Englishman,' he said flatly. I told you this room is cut off from the shaft by the double doors. Another step and you will have no stomach. Bond looked at the confident, narrowed eyes and stopped. Go ahead, Krebs. When they were both tied securely and painfully to the arms and legs of two tubular steel chairs a few feet apart beneath the glass wall map, Krebs left the room. He came back in a moment with a mechanic's blowtorch. He set the ugly machine on the desk and set a match to it. A blue flame hissed out a couple of inches into the room. He picked up the instrument and walked towards Gala. He stopped a few feet to one side of her. Now then, said Drax grimly, let's get this over without any fuss. The good Krebs is an artist with one of those things. We used to call him the Zfangsman, the Persuader. I shall never forget the way he went over the last spy we caught together. Just south of the Rhine, wasn't it, Krebs? Bond pricked up his ears. Yes, mein Capitaine, Krebs chuckled reminiscently. <laughs> it was a pig of a Belgian. All right, then, said Drax. Just remember, you two, there's no fair play down here, no jolly good sports and all that. This is business. The voice cracked like a whip on the word. You, he looked at Gala Brand. Who are you working for? Gala was silent. Anywhere you like, Krebs. Krebs's mouth was half open. His tongue ran up and down his lower lip. He seemed to be having difficulty with his breathing as he took a step towards the girl. The little flame roared greedily. Stop, said Bond coldly. She works for Scotland Yard, so do I. These things were pointless now. They were of no conceivable use to Drax. In any case, by tomorrow afternoon there might be no Scotland Yard. That's better, said Drax. Now, does anybody know you are prisoners? Did you stop and telephone anyone? No, he said. If I had, they'd be here by now. True, said Drax reflectively. In that case, I am no longer interested in you, and I congratulate you on making the interview so harmonious. It might have been more difficult if you had been alone. A girl is always useful on these occasions. Krebs put that down. You may go. Tell the others what is necessary, they will be wondering. 
I shall entertain our guests for a while, and then I shall come up to the house. Fair standard? Yes, mein Capitaine. Krebs reluctantly placed the softly roaring blowtorch on the desk beside Drax. In case you need it, he said, looking hopefully at Gala and Bond. He went out through the double doors. Drax looked benevolently at Bond. You don't know how I have longed for an English audience, he said as if he was addressing a press conference. You don't know how I have longed to tell what this is all in aid of, as— he grinned wolfishly. We Englishmen say. You can spare us the jokes, said Bond roughly. Get on with your story, Kraut. Drax's eyes blazed momentarily. A uh, Kraut? Yes, I am indeed a Reichsdeutscher. The mouth beneath the red moustache savoured the fine word. And even England will soon agree that they have been licked by just one single German— and then perhaps they'll stop calling us Krauts by order. The words were yelled out, and the whole of Prussian militarism was in the parade ground bellow. Drax glowered across at Bond. My real name is Graf Hugo von der Drache. The wounded and mutilated man the stupid allies brought to the British field hospital was indeed a German officer. Drax spoke through the smoke of his cigar. During the year that I was being pushed from one hospital to the next, I made my plans down to the smallest detail. They consisted, quite simply, of revenge on England for what she had done to me and to my country. It gradually became an obsession, I admit it. Every day during the year of the rape and destruction of my country, my hatred and scorn for the English grew more bitter. The veins on Drax's face started to swell, and suddenly he pounded on the desk and shouted across at them, looking with bulging eyes from one to the other. I loathe and despise you all, you swine, useless, idle, decadent fools hiding behind your bloody white cliffs while other people fight your battles, too weak to defend your colonies, toadying to America with your hats in your hands, stinking snobs who'll do anything for money. Ha! He was triumphant. I knew that all I needed was money and the facade of a gentleman. Fear. To me, a gentleman is just someone I can take advantage of. Those bloody fools in blades, for instance, moneyed oafs for months. I took thousands of pounds off them, swindled them right under their noses until you came along and upset the apple cart. Drax wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Suddenly he chuckled and squinted quizzically down his nose at Bond and the girl. "'I don't think you two will give me any more trouble,' he said, and his voice was quite calm and certain. "'Krebs never makes a mistake with his knots. "'These doors will open once more, just before noon tomorrow. "'A few minutes later there will be nothing left of either of you. "'Not even,' he added as he wrenched open the inner door, the stoppings in your teeth. The outer door slammed. The only thing Drax had overlooked was the blowtorch. Painfully, Bond inched his way to the blue, hissing flame. And then it was over. Melted by the fierce heat, the copper strands parted one by one, and suddenly his arms were free. Within another minute he and Gala were standing up, rubbing the feeling back into their limbs. Bond said frankly, God knows what we do now, Gala. But, he looked at his watch, it's past midnight and we've to decide quickly. At any moment it may occur to Drax to send guards down to see that we're all right, and God knows what time he'll be coming down to set the gyros. Gala twisted her body round like a cat. She gazed at him with her mouth open, her face taut with excitement. The gyros, she whispered, to set the gyros. She leant weakly back against the wall, her eyes searching Bond's face. Don't you see? Her voice was on the edge of hysteria. After he's gone, we could alter the gyros back, back to the old flight plan. Then the rocket will simply fall into the North Sea where it's supposed to go. She stepped away from the wall and seized his shirt in both hands and looked imploringly at him. Can't we? she said. Can't we? Do you know the other settings? asked Bond sharply. Of course I do, she said urgently. I've been living with them for a year. We won't have a weather report, but we'll just have to chance that. The forecast this morning said we would have the same conditions as today. 
The big, round mouths of the ventilator shafts were spaced about ten yards apart and about four feet off the floor. Bond carefully opened the hinged grating that covered one of them and looked up. Forty feet away there was a faint glimmer from the moonlight outside. It was going to be a painful business, but there was no doubt they could inch their way up one of these shafts, like mountaineers up a rock chimney, and in the turn at the top lie hidden from anything but the sort of painstaking search that would be difficult in the morning with all the officials from London round the site. Bond knelt down, and the girl climbed onto his back and started up. An hour later, their feet and shoulders bruised and cut, they lay exhausted, squeezed tight in each other's arms, their heads inches away from the circular grating directly above the outside door, and listened to the guards restlessly shifting their feet in the darkness a hundred yards away. Five o'clock, six, seven. Slowly the sun came up behind the dome, and the seagulls started to call in the cliffs, and then suddenly there were three figures walking towards them in the distance, passed by a fresh platoon of guards doubling, chins up, knees up, to relieve the night watch. The figures came nearer, and the squinting, exhausted eyes of the hidden couple could see every detail of Drax's blood-orange face, the lean, pale foxiness of Dr. Walter, the suety, overslept puffiness of Krebs. The three men walked like executioners, saying nothing. Drax took out his key, and they silently filed through the door a few feet below the taut bodies of Bond and Gala. Then for ten minutes there was silence, except for the occasional boom of voices up the ventilator shaft, as the three men moved about down on the steel floor around the exhaust pit. Bond smiled to himself at the thought of the rage and consternation on Drax's face, the miserable Krebs wilting under the lash of Drax's tongue, the bitter accusation in Walter's eyes. And the two bodies lay and waited, nursing their pain. Half an hour, half a year later, Walter and Krebs and Drax filed out below them. "'Hold it, sir, Hugo, just like that, please. Arm in the air!' The bulbs flashed and the bank of cameras whirred and clicked for the last time, and Drax turned and walked the few yards towards the dome, almost, it seemed to Bond, looking him straight in the eye through the grating above the door of the site. The small crowd of reporters and cameramen dissolved and straggled off across the concrete apron, leaving only a nervously chatting group of officials to wait for Drax to emerge. Slither, scrape, rip, his shoulders carefully expanding and contracting, blistered, blood-stained feet scrabbling for the sharp knobs of iron, Bond, his lacerated body tearing its way down the forty feet of shaft, prayed that the girl would have strength to stand it when she followed. A last ten-foot drop that jarred his spine, a kick at the grating, and he was out on the steel floor and running for the stairs, leaving a trail of red footprints and a spray of blood drops from his raw shoulders. The great deadly needle in the centre might have been made of glass. Looking above him as he sweated and panted up the endless sweep of the iron stairway, it was difficult for him to see where its tapering nose ended and the sky began. In front of him there was the spidery arm of the gantry folded back against the wall, and Bond's hand was at the lever, and the arm was slowly stretching down and out towards the square hairline on the glittering skin of the rocket that was the door of the gyro chamber. Press, click, and the tiny door had flicked open on its hard spring. Inside, careful not to cut your head, the gleaming handles beneath the staring compass roses. Turn, twist, steady, a last look, a glance at his watch, four minutes to go. Don't panic, back out, door, click. As Bond shot down the gantry, he caught a glimpse of Gala's tense white face as she stood holding open the outer door of Drax's office. God, how his body hurt! A final leap and a clumsy swerve to the right clang as Gala slammed the outer door. Through the noise of it all, above the beating of his heart, Bond heard the sudden crackle of static and then the voice of the BBC announcer coming from the big set in Drax's room. Would be five minutes delay. Sir Hugo has been persuaded to say a few words into the microphone. Your Majesty, men and women of England, I am about to change the course of England's history. In a few minutes' time, the lives of all of you will be altered 
in some cases, uh, drastically, by the impact of the Moonraker. I am very proud and pleased that fate has singled me out from amongst all my fellow countrymen to fire this great arrow of vengeance into the skies and thus to proclaim for all time and for all the world to witness the might of my fatherland. I hope that this occasion will be forever a warning that the fate of my country's enemies will be written in dust, in ashes, in tears, and in blood. Bond glanced at his watch. Only a minute more, he said to Gala. The noise is going to be terrific. I don't know about the heat. It won't last long, and the steel walls may stand up to it. Gala looked at him. She smiled. If you hold me, it won't be too bad, she said. And now Sir Hugo has his hand on the switch, and he's watching the chronometer. Ten. Bond clutched Gala closer to him. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Fire. Bond's heart jumped into his throat at the shout. He felt Gala shudder. Silence. Then a soft thud came to Bond and Gala. Louder, louder, the tiled floor began to tremble under their feet. A hurricane screamed. They were being pulverized by it. The walls were quaking, steaming. Their legs began going out of control under their teetering bodies. Hold her up, hold her up. Stop it, stop it, stop that noise. And then there was silence. Silence you could feel. Hold. Squeeze. And they were on the floor in Drax's office. And the smoke's clearing and the filthy smell of burning iron and paint being sucked out by the air conditioner, and the steel wall is bent towards them like a huge blister. Gala's eyes are open, and she's smiling. But the rocket. What happened? London? North Sea? The radio looks all right. Through the sound barrier, travelling perfectly right in the centre of the radar screen, a perfect launching. Sir Hugo must be a proud man. He's out there in the channel now. The submarine went off like a rocket. <laughs> must be doing more than thirty knots, throwing up a huge wake. Off the east, Goodwin's now travelling north. She'll soon be up with the patrol ships. They'll have a view of the launching and of the landing. Quite a surprise trip, that. No one here had an inkling. Even the naval authorities seem a bit mystified. The C&C Nor has been on the telephone. But now that's all I can tell you from here, and I'll hand you over to Peter Trimble on board HMS Maganza somewhere off the east coast. And this is Peter Trimble speaking. Uh, we could see the Moonraker going up. Terrific sight. Noise like thunder. Long flame coming out of the tail. Must have been ten miles away, but you couldn't miss the light. Yes, Captain? Oh, yes, I see. Well, that's very interesting. Big submarine coming up fast, only about a mile away. I suppose it's the one they say Sir Hugo's aboard with his men. Uh, none of us here were told anything about her. Not flying colours. Very mysterious. I've got her now, quite clear in my glasses. Uh, we've changed course to intercept her. Captain says she isn't one of ours. Thinks she must be a foreigner. Hello? She's broken out her colours. What's that? Good heavens. The captain says she's a Russian. I say. And now she's hauled down her colours and she's submerging. Did you hear that? We fired a shot across her bows. Uh, but she's disappeared. What's that? The Asdic operator says she's going even faster underwater. Twenty-five knots. Terrific. Well, she can't see much underwater, but she's right in the target area now. Twelve minutes past noon. The Moonraker must have turned and be on her way down. A thousand miles up, coming down at ten thousand miles an hour. She'll be here any second now. Hope there's not going to be a tragedy. The Russian's well inside the danger zone. The radar operator's holding up his hand. That means she's due. She's coming. She's coming. You're not even a whisper. God, what's that? Look out! Look out! Terrific explosion. A black cloud going up into the air. There's a tidal wave coming at us. Great wall of water tearing down. There goes the submarine. God, thrown out of the water upside down. It's coming. It's coming. Two hundred dead so far, and about the same number missing, said M. Reports still coming in from the East Coast. Most of our losses were among the patrol craft, two of them capsized, including the Maganza. Commanding officer missing, and that BBC chap. Goodwin lightships broke their moorings. There are going to be some pretty heavy bills to pay when everything gets sorted out. It was the next afternoon, and Bond, a rubber-tipped stick beside his chair, was back where he had started. 
across the desk from the quiet man with the cold grey eyes who had invited him to dinner and a game of cards a hundred years ago. He held a cigarette clumsily in one gloved hand. Incredibly, M had invited him to smoke. There was a soft burr from the intercom on M's desk, and a ruby light winked on and off. M picked up the single earphone and leant towards it. Yes, he said. There was a pause. I'll take it on the cabinet line. He picked up the white receiver from the bank of four telephones. Yes, said M, speaking. There was a pause. Yes, sir. Another pause. That's very kind of you, sir. M put the white receiver back on its cradle. Bond carefully focused again on the grey eyes across the desk. That was the Prime Minister, M said gruffly. Says he wants you and Miss Brand out of the country. M lowered his eyes and looked stolidly into the bowl of his pipe. You're both to be out by tomorrow afternoon. There are too many people in this case who know your faces. Might put two and two together when they see the shape you're both in. Go anywhere you like. Seems like unlimited expenses for both of you.